Are you ready? Sea of Red, it's time for another Fireside Chat, the official podcast of Flames fans. It's go time. Well, we're back for another Fireside Chat, and as always, I'm Dan, but I'm not here with Matt this week. I'm here with uh, two other co-hosts. I'm here with Kevin Olenek from the Hockey Podcast and Mike Gold, who is from all over the web. So why don't I let each of my hosts introduce themselves. Kevin, why don't we start with you? Well, hello. I, I'm Kevin. I'm the host of the pod, uh, Hockey Podcast. You can follow us on Twitter at podcast underscore hockey. Uh, Facebook.com, The Hockey Podcast. YouTube.com, The Hockey Podcast. We recap weekday Flame games Monday to Thursday and then do a regular Monday podcast. We do chat one about one of the enemy teams of the Flames as well, which is the Vancouver Canucks, but we that's try okay. to cover we'll keep all you. NHL. But that's that's fine. I'm out, out in the rainland here anyway. Uh, and also I write for the Dub Network, call play-by-play play for the Greater Vancouver Canadians the, uh, BC, e, in the BCEHL. So, Kevin, what I have to ask, to that's know. kind of a caveat. We call, or we do a show after weekday Flames games. Are you just like old men and want to go to bed early on weekends, or what's the deal there? No, I I, I do play-by-play play on weekends for the oh, okay. Greater Vancouver Canadians. And the other so the other group is it, everyone else is afraid to host. That's the problem. Ah, uh, there you go. Okay. And Mike Gold, you've been on the show a few times. You've been with us live at uh, Flames Training Camp. We've had you on recorded shows a couple times. Why don't you introduce yourself again for those that might not know you? Yeah, I'm Mike Gould. Uh, I've been, I guess, on this show, I don't know how many times now, half a dozen times maybe. Um, yeah, I've been on Fan 960. You might have heard me there talking with either uh, Ryan Pinder or Pat Steinberg, mostly about the Stockton Heat, uh, which is the team that I was able to cover uh, last season at the Scotiabank Saddle when they were playing here because of all things that broke loose. Um, and that was a lot of fun. Got to see them in person when... Not a whole lot of people did, being in the empty Scotiabank Saddleome with probably about 25 it's people. It's a weird feeling, isn't it? Playing inside of it. Very weird. Um, I write. I write for flamesnation.ca and a bunch of other places. Uh, and I am the public address announcer for the Oak Tokes Oilers in the Alberta Junior Hockey League. And they have lost, I think, nine consecutive games that I've been at. So, uh, I, you know what I that means? You're not going to be a public design. address announcer very long. This guy's a bad omen. Yeah, it's uh, it's not going so well lately. Um, they're scoring a lot of goals. The goaltending's been a little bit suspect, but um, they'll get back into it. Sounds like the start the Flames usually have, doesn't it? Losing nine games in a row coming yeah. into November. No kidding. I mean, well, you look at how many season openers they've lost in a row, right? I mean, it's up to twelve now. Yeah. On the streak in North American professional sports. Yeah. Well, and let's talk a little That's, bit about uh, this week, guys. Uh, let's recap these games we usually do. And I think this week was really the first week that we saw the Flames maybe face some adversity. Um, we saw them start the week off since we talked last in Montreal uh, or against Montreal. Yeah, in Montreal. And they lost 4-2 to two in that game. Um, I, I think, I don't know what, about you guys, but I didn't think the Flames probably played the best 60 minutes there. Kevin, what were your thoughts on that game? Yeah, it felt, uh, it felt, I guess, and it really, this really started with um, San Jose too. The you know, you look after that Rangers game, that was probably the height of where the Flames were at this year. And then San Jose, they had the letdown, and I felt like Montreal. They also came with a little bit of a hangover. Uh, didn't looked at the Montreal Canadiens, uh, didn't take them too seriously. I didn't think, and. Um, yeah, they they stumbled for sure. It kind of felt like last year when they lose a game and then they'd go into the next game on the loss and lose again, and they sort of had to break that funk. Matt, Mike, what were you thinking about that one? Yeah, it was sort of a continuation of the third period of the San Jose game where watching that San Jose game, as soon as they didn't score in the second period, after they'd had like a dozen glorious chances, you knew they were going to give up a week one in the third. And... It just sort of felt the same way that the puck wasn't really destined to go in for them in that Montreal game. Um, I thought it was, you know, it was sort of close, but uh, Montreal was definitely carrying the balance of the play in that one. And I think that was sort of the first of a couple consecutive full games where the Flames really struggled to generate a whole lot of high danger stuff. And it certainly didn't look like any of their chances really gave Jake Allen much, gave him much to work with, honestly. Um, it, it was a tough one, uh, but you know it wasn't the sort of game where, and, and it was also the start of something that I liked, where they put Monahan up with uh, Mangiapane and Coleman, 
uh, which I think has, through this sort of stretch of eh, play, has been maybe their most consistent Do you think you'd keep that line? Games. Yeah, definitely. Well, I, I kind of disagree, because I, I feel like Coleman has struggled the last little bit. He's been taking a lot of penalties. Um... I, f- I don't know. I feel he's a better fit with Backlund than it's he like is Sam with Bennett Monaghan. all over again. Yeah, except older and American. Um, <laughs> but, I, but I just, I'd like to see, I, I mean, we're off track already, and it only took four minutes. Congratulations okay. to us. But I, I'd like to see Dubé with Monaghan and Mangiapane, and I'd like to see Coleman back with Backlund and Pitlick. I just don't feel that Monaghan and Coleman are on the same page for some reason. I don't, I don't much care who the third guy on that monahan Mangiapane line is as long as they keep Monaghan and Mangiapane together. Uh, I think it's been a relatively good stylistic fit with those two. Um, and you can see sort of Mangiapane has some of the Goudreau-ish tendencies, but he is also, I think, a little bit better at retrieving pucks for Monaghan to get. Um, I would agree with that. And yeah, I mean, I can, I, I, I can see the point that you're making about Coleman. Um, and I... They got to get Backlund going. I haven't liked Backlund as much as Monahan, honestly, this season, uh, which is not great because Monahan ha- didn't have the greatest start to the season, um, and it's hard. You know, looking in the off season, everybody thought they were going to come in with a Coleman Backlund Pitlick line that would be good at both ends of the ice, and you know would be able to score some goals. And I'm not too worried about Coleman's production. I think it's going to come. Um, ugh, Pitlick on the on the wing. Ugh, I, I don't like it. I don't like that. Where'd at you all. put Pitlick? So, but. Uh, waivers. <laughs> I think he's, he's. I mean, he's the, got a spot in this lineup. I just don't know if it's the number two yeah. guy. I mean, he's a capable NHLer. Oh, yeah. If we look at the guys he's replacing, I'd rather have him than Dominique Simone or Josh Levo. Like he's, oh, sure. he's a capable guy. I'm just not sure he's your number two winger. He's just so slow. He's so slow. And when he gets the puck, he, he's he he is the flame who reminds me the most of Blake Como since Blake Como left. Also, a story from waivers. But going the other way, yeah. I just, I guess the other thing, I guess, man, maybe we'll we'll delve into this more. They ha- they do. It is a mystery to me. They have to find a way to get Andre Majapani more ice time in some way. So I do agree with you, Mike. Um, in terms of Monahan and Majapani, I would like to see them together. But ultimately, I think the other question going forward is how do you give Andre Majapani more ice time? I, I totally agree, and uh, I, it's hard for me. Because with the way that the Flames' first power play unit is currently constructed, I don't want any of those four forwards coming off of it. Um, and even as much guff as Sean Monaghan gets, if you look at his if you look at his numbers on the power play this year, they're in the top twenty in the league. I mean, you can't take them off of it at this nope. point. Um, but you know, it, it's hard because the the second power play unit it just doesn't have the same personnel, and it's it's never going to get the lion's share of the activity with this coach because he's clearly a guy who likes to. You know, favor his first unit. That's and the that's strength, the unit I mean, of what? That's uh, Lucic, Backlund, Mangiapane. That's the yeah, yeah. with uh, and Dubé. That's and, the law firm. And, yeah, that's right. We we're yeah. talking about this on yeah. Kevin's show. I said we were trying to figure out the lines. I said the fourth line is just Lucic and company. It's like a law firm. Whoever you want to put with them, Lucic and associates. Yeah, I mean, sort of tying things back into the Montreal game, which we were theoretically supposed to be that's talking okay. about. Um, we go off track all know, the time. I mean, the guy. If I'm making a change to that top power play unit, it's probably on defense, and it's probably to get Oliver Shillington onto it. Um, but the way that he's been playing of yep. late, um, I mean, holy mackerel! What what is there to say? <laughs> I mean, uh, and obviously in that Montreal game, uh, you know, gets another point on the backland goal to open the scoring, and uh, you know, it's it's been awfully impressive to see what he's been able to. I do. I didn't say this off the top, and I probably should before we go too far. Um, Matt is not with us. He had a family emergency this week, so that's why I need two guys to fill his shoes. So that's why Mike and Kevin are with us. So let's ch- chat about that Toronto game. So the next night, the Flames go to Toronto. Um, I think a lot, I don't know about you guys, but I thought a lot of the same problems that we saw from the Montreal game still in Toronto. Like we, I thought the Flames played a very similar game on the ice against the Maple Leafs, and they got the point, and in some ways, you can't really complain when you're giving up two to the East and you're getting one. Like if you're if you're gonna lose, you might as well give them up to the East and get one out of it. But I didn't think a great game here, Mike. Why don't we start you off with this one? I mean, you can't complain about how Dan Vladar played. Nope. Um, but other than that, uh, you know, it wasn't their greatest game. Um, I think uh, off the top of my head, the penalties were quite lopsided in that game. They were. I've um, got the. It might have uh, looked a little bit different. 
Yeah, it was three to one uh, for Calgary. So Toronto had three power plays, and I think honestly, if Calgary had had more opportunities there, it might have been a very different game. Um, but you know, it was just the sort of game where they didn't score in the first period, and I don't think they scored in the second period, and you could just sort of sense the frustration setting in. Um, and obviously, they got a, a hell of a goal from Oliver Shillington again um, to sort of get them up. But it, it just it, it never it sort of felt tenuous uh, that lead as soon as they got it. It reminded me of the, la- the the Leafs game they played last year, where they scored late and then they gave up two straight two straight goals to Nylander and lost. That it was the exact same vibes. And during that Leafs game last year, I never thought we would say a heck of a goal from Oliver Shillington. Yeah, no kidding. I mean, I always had hope for Oliver Shillington. Um, beginning of last season, I wrote an article uh, that was basically the Flames should not trade Oliver Shillington. And at that time, my expectations were, you know, this is a guy who has offensive ability, and the defense is actually, at, in the NHL, the results have been better than the offense for Oliver it's just he hasn't really been put in high leverage offensive situations and maybe they got a top four guy here maybe if they or at the very least a bottom pairing guy and I don't I don't think anybody expected him to be well let's come back to Shillen and I want to chat with you guys a little bit more about him later because there's some more story of him this week um Kevin any thoughts about the Toronto game uh yeah Vladar Vladar again um the nice thing about uh, Dan Vladar has been found money for the Flames um, getting Reminds a me of this other guy we brought in. There's a third stringer in San Jose. Is uh, Mika something? Kypersoff, I think. Sim- yeah, that sounds about right. Ky- Kypersoff, yeah. Uh, Kipper, yeah. But I, he, he I, at least they got a point. I agree with you. It wasn't, like, I didn't think they played terrible, but I didn't think they played well. Um, you could see that Oliver, it was Oliver Shillington's really f- was really frustrated with his performance. Um, we'll dig into that in a little bit. Um, but it was also one of those games, you know, we look back and I, I think we've rehashed Jack Eichel enough, but, you know, it's very, I think that was one of the games like, you know, they really truly do not have a natural yep. offensive goal scorer. And they had a late power play in that game. Um, had they have taken advantage of it, they probably, they would have won. Um, but you know that's that I think became a glaring issue to me, and I think this it game, turned up later this week. This game reminded me a lot of Flames games of the past couple seasons, where everybody seemed to kind of be doing their own thing. The lines weren't working together. There didn't seem to be a lot of cohesion. Every line kind of it seemed, felt to me like was trying to do its own thing, and that's why they couldn't come together. Do you guys think that's fair in that Toronto game? Yeah, it like everyone was trying to be the star, and there were no kind of supporting players. Yeah, they were forcing it a bit. I agree. Um, there's yeah, there's still you know there's still some of that last year flame stuff that I think Daryl Sutter is trying to weed out of the team, um, and that's one of it for sure. There there still seems to be a bit of fragility with this team in certain situations. But it takes a while to beat that out of your team. Yeah, for sure. For sure, and we're only 16 games into the year, so. We talked about a great game from Dan Vladar. I think we can all agree the next one probably more impressive. Vladar gets his first NHL shutout and his second straight start, which I don't think anyone expects on this road trip, as the Flames best the Ottawa Senators uh, for nothing. And not only did Vladar get his first shootout, but Walker Dewar played his first NHL game. He was in for Pitlick, who had some sort of an undisclosed lower body injury. And I don't know about you guys, but when I started watching this one, I thought the Flames looked like that Toronto-Montreal team in the first. It wasn't a great first, and they seemed to sort of come alive after the first. Kevin, what did you think of this one? Yeah, yeah I, I'm surprised you did call them the Ottawa Senators because it felt like it was the Binghamton and Friends Senators. Uh, um, I it was this was uh, I agree with you. In the first period, they kind of started slow, and then they started to pick up a bit as the game went on. Um, this was the one game I was, I mean, we'll, maybe we'll dig into this a little bit later, but I, this, this was a game and this was after Mike, you, you shared the Valamaki article. This was when Nikita Zadarov to me. We'll talk about that later too. Yeah. Showed partly why I think Daryl is putting him in the lineup over you. So in a lot of ways, he's active um, I thought his goal was hilarious. He just shrugs his shoulder. The reality is, is they won because they're, I, I think part of, it was the Bigman Terra, Bigman and Senators, and Vladar was great, no question about it. But we got to just say it, Anton Forsberg was awful 
in that game. Like, A-W-W-W-F-U-L, awful. Which, I mean, helped. I've never been a big Anton Forsberg fan. I've never thought he's a fantastic goalie. Mike, what'd you think of this one? Yeah, the Sens game, I mean, it was a game that they had to win, uh, given their little their little mini, stri- uh, mini stretch of losing, and, and they got a lot of goals, which they needed, and... Um, you know, I, I thought the Monaghan line was, again, pretty good. The top line was better. Um, the Zadorov goal was, again, like you said, Kevin, pretty funny. Um, yeah, Zadorov, I mean, I, I still have yet to see a game where he's impressed me. Like, like I think he's been competent in games. Um, and, and honestly, I don't think I've seen much more than that from Yusuf Alamaki either. I think to me, um, though, Mike, and tell me if you feel differently, I feel Yusuf doesn't have to impress me as much at 750 as Zadorov does at 3.7 million. Like, I, I think if, if, we're paying, if we're paying Zadorov 750,000, I'd be impressed by him. Yeah, probably. I mean, it's, it's hard to say. Uh, I mean, I, have, I would honestly prefer to see Michael Stone in the lineup most nights, but... He was finding in Ottawa. Like I had no, I had no issues with his game in Ottawa. Um, yeah, I just, I, I still question the the personnel that this team has at the bottom of its lineup quite a bit. Um, especially, you know, at forward, I posted a tweet today. I think that said, uh, you know, the the problem with the current Flames lineup is that thirty three percent of its forwards are guys who you probably don't want to have getting more than eight or nine minutes a night under any circumstances. Mike, does it feel to and, you yeah. like this team was maybe waiting for something to drop? Let's be honest; it felt like they were kind of waiting on the Eichel deal to happen in the summer. When they couldn't get it done, they quickly went and signed a bunch of guys. It kind of felt like they were leaving some cap room or maybe leaving some holes in the lineup to fill either from the AHL or elsewhere. And Matt and I kind of talked about this, and it kind of felt like when something didn't happen, it's, okay, who's available? It's possible. I mean, um, I, I don't know. I, I never thought Eichel was realistic, to be honest. Me neither. Uh, but hey, maybe, and, and maybe, maybe not maybe, him, maybe. but, you know, you know Trees always in on yeah. something. It just felt like there was another shoe to drop that didn't drop. Yeah, I mean... With how Tree has been operating lately, I can't believe he would operate under the assumption that he would get a deal done. But, um, I mean, there are still players out there. I mean, there are teams that are going to probably make some trades. Dallas, if they keep playing poorly. I've been saying when I've been on Kevin's show, I think guys are going to want it out of Chicago pretty soon. Yeah, well, I don't know. I, that's the problem, though. I don't really know who I'd want out of Chicago. I mean, maybe Dylan Strome, but, like, I don't really know if he's going to be a, a huge difference maker. Um, but like a guy like Tyler Sagan out of Dallas or a guy like, I mean, heck, if the Canucks go nuclear, there's about six or seven guys who I'd want off of that team. Um, you know, I I do think that there is not, not even just a need for top end additional talent, just, just players. Capable middle six guys. Yeah. Guys who can play like 14 minutes and you can be like. You're gonna do something good in those 14 minutes, not just guys who you put out there so nothing happens. Um, and I think that's sometimes a little bit the reason why you see the Flames only scoring two goals on some nights where they lose three two, is because they just don't have enough guys who have that ceiling. Um, uh, and that's fair. But- and and I wonder how much that two could be. I mean, I think Daryl has, and we saw this from training camp. Mike, you you and Kevin might have thoughts on this as well, but we saw Daryl run a different training camp, not as focused on the rookies and stuff. And I wonder if maybe, again, Tree was expecting one of those roles to be taken up by Zari, Peltier, somebody like that. And when they didn't make the team, it's like, hey, now we got to find that veteran guy instead of bringing up the young kid. Because Daryl has always been more of a veteran guy than a rookies guy. I always, I look back to something that Daryl said at the end of last season that just sits with me, it's still sitting with me, and he talked about sort of the sense of entitlement that he saw. My belief has been that, that the Flames were higher on some of the, these prospects, the Valimakis, the Dubays, even the, the Matthew Phillips, I'll throw that name in there, the Glenn Goddens of the world, than Daryl was. And Daryl saw didn't see what every what the everyone else did and he ran and do you think his, the team was high on them because they were good players because they were the best they had like i think I, sometimes we overvalue i think as fans we tend to overvalue our own prospects sometimes because they're our guy or they're our pick that sort of thing and i'm wondering if the flames were kind of doing the same i think that's very probable i think that's i think that they were i mean 
I mean, I'm not in the room when Tree is making a trade, obviously, but I, I'm assuming that he's not hearing... Not anymore, not since the restraining order. That's true. That's very true. Oh, is this being recorded now, or will this be edited <laughs> out? Uh, but I'm sure the name Yusuf Valamaki and Dylan Dubé came up enough for him to think that they had some prospects there. But um, certainly from Daryl's perspective, it wasn't what Tree Living saw. Um, and, and even when Daryl was the GM here, I mean, he liked to over-ripen guys in the AHL. And I think that might be sort of his philosophy again, is if he's picking who's getting called up, let's over-ripen some of those guys, which, I mean, we'll talk AHL a bit later, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing when you have the depth. But the question is, do we have the depth to do that? Mike, what do you think? I think Daryl is a capable evaluator of talent. I mean, we saw it early in the season. He, I mean, he was... A little slower than I would have been probably to put Oliver Shillington in the top four, but he did it very quickly, um, you know. And and it was something that I was thrilled to see, even though he, you know, he's the twenty four year old competing against Nikita Zadorov, who has probably what three hundred NHL games, and it was just, but it was the clear choice, and he, you know, he immediately recognized that, and it's been a no brainer ever since. Um, and I think I trust Daryl's ass- assessment of the prospects the Flames have in their system. Um, and but but that being said, I don't think them like I don't think the AHL guys not getting big views at training camp has much to do with how they performed. I think it has more to do with Daryl wanting to see the guys who he was expecting to see first, seeing sense. the guys like Brad Richardson first, seeing the guys like Trevor Lewis first and waiting for them to falter before he goes to that well. Um, and giving those guys who are AHL guys the chance to prove themselves again for him in the AHL before he brings them up. And to their credits, uh, you know, th- that, that top line in Stockton has not slowed down. All three guys are point a game. Uh, and I, I think, you know... Daryl has gotten more of a book on what guys like Trevor Lewis and Brad Richardson are in the NHL at this point, and it hasn't hurt the team in terms of its record so much to this point that it's been something that you can look at and say, well, Daryl, maybe you shouldn't have done that. So I understand why he has done it, and at this point I would expect, you know, I'm not sure how much longer we're going to see all four of Richardson, Lewis, Lucic, and Pitlick in the lineup. Um... Because I think, ultimately, I think Daryl is probably going to look at it and say, you know, we have, having a couple of the guys in these, have a, having a couple of these guys in the lineup is good for our two-way game. And just having a couple but, of guys in the press box is good if we need a body. Yeah, and uh, but we need more scoring, yeah. I think, is ultimately what it's going to come down to. And when you have a guy like Adam Brzezicka, who has nine goals in 11 games for Stockton, at some point, something's got to give. And right? all those guys, I think, you know, if we wave them, they probably don't get claimed, and you know maybe it'd be good to have a veteran down in in Stockton. Yeah, that's a young team. It that is, is a very very young team. You know, you put Richardson um, down there, you get some leadership. Yeah, and you know Byron Fraze is they, they're old. And Daryl's a coach who always seems to want guys to prove themselves. Maybe this is his way of making those guys prove themselves. Look, Glenn, we're not going to give you a spot just because you're the next guy up. I'm going to bring Richardson in, who's a proven NHLer. Change my mind. Yeah, it's and, tough to say what the deal is with Glenn Gawden, but uh, what were you going to say, Dan? And I think that might be something similar to what we're seeing with Zadorov and um, and Valley. Of you know what, this is the proven NHLer. Fight your way into the lineup. Mm-hmm. Well, Shillington made them. Shillington play him. did, yeah. Like, like he forced his way into the lineup with the way that he was playing, and there was there was absolutely no denying the way that he was playing at the start of the season. And once once he was in, he has not. He has had, you know, maybe two glaring mistakes in 13, 14, 15 games this season, and they have been dramatically outweighed mm-hmm. by the value that he's provide, provided in the offensive and, honestly, the defensive zones. Uh, and I, I mean, so that's what Yusuf Valamaki's going to have to do. And you know what? He's two years younger than, than Oliver Shillington. Yep. So I am hardly in a position where yep. I'm saying Yusuf Valamaki's cooked. It's just too bad he can't be put on waivers because I think right now you just want him playing. Or, sorry, it's too bad he can't go down without being on waivers. Yeah, yeah. he's sent down without waivers, yeah. Yeah, I, I honestly don't think that would be a bad idea because, like, if, if they could send him down, because then you could probably bring up a guy like Connor Mackey and get him some looks, too, 
uh, considering them. Yeah. Well, and I think even then I would keep Mackey down there unless you're going to give him the ice time yeah. and let him play. But I mean, then Stone will get in the lineup too. That's true. You got Michael Stone. Yeah, absolutely. Let's finish off this week and then we'll come back to that. Anybody have anything they want to talk about with this Philly game? To me, it's just kind of a game. The Flames took uh, far too many penalties, had some okay penalty killing that uh, I think saved their butts. And that was one of the best. Yeah. That was that was one of the best games, game. although he didn't score that Johnny Gaudreau. I've seen Johnny Gaudreau play. He was flying out there. I one agree. of the better games I've seen from Lindholm this year. I think he's been a little up and down, to be honest. My worry, though, if you get a lot of games like that, you're going to burn out those top six. Like, there was so much special teams time. Yeah, uh, and I think I think it's that game was the illustration of what we're talking about a lot of it's tough with these Richardsons and the Lewises and sort of these bottom six guys that you can't rely on them necessarily offensively. And that that is a concern I have going forward is the depth. And that's been a concern with the Flames for a while, right? Is we got two lines that can score and nobody else. Yeah. 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 My, my issue also with some of those lines is that, you know, even when the Flames have had low event fourth lines in the past few years, they've been able – to hold their own defensively a little bit and recently we're seeing that line getting shelled at both ends of the ice yeah. and that's something that it just can't stand you know you, you you need you need to be able to you need to be able to pull your weight in at least one zone um so got to be better there i have one more concern actually now that i think about it here and i'm looking at only one all right air it for us uh it is well rasmus anderson no goals this year noah hannafin no goals this year um, we don't expect anything from Eric Branson offensively. That's fine. Chris Tan have one goal. Uh, I would like to see more offense from the defense other than Oliver Shillington. That is... I think like Mike said, though, I think those defensemen have been so busy trying to play defense that they haven't had as much time to be the offensive guys we need. Yeah, that's true. But um, it's you... And also, when you're only playing one uh, one defenseman on your PP... It's also, I think, hard to get a lot more guys uh, scoring there, too. Yeah, but to, to, to Kevin's point, both of the defensemen who are currently on the power play don't have any goals. Um, that's true. Which is, yeah, like, like I, I'm not too worried about Anderson. I think the goals are going to come for Anderson. With Hannafin, I'm less sure. Uh, I don't think he should be on the power play, to be honest. I just don't think that's really his game, um, to be honest. And I, I think there is, you know, there's offense with Noah Hannafin, but he's not... He's not the guy who's overloading the net with pressure, ever. No. And so, you know, Oliver Shillington is far more aggressive from the point, but he's also got a heck of a stride to be able to catch up and, you know, if there's a rush that goes the other way. Um, I, Matt I, always wants to convert Shillington to forward. He's not here to tell us this week. So oh. he's always, for years, he said, let's make Shillington a forward. Yeah. No, not anymore. But, no, uh, <laughs> no, no. No. At this point. We need a right winger on that second line. We already said that. Yeah. Yeah, no, at this point, I, I think, um, I, yeah, I definitely swap Shillington and Hannafin on the PP. I'm, I'm not too worried about the top pairing, though, in terms of the way that it's, you know, play driving at 5-on-5. Five five. I think it's been okay. Um, but the goals, you'd like to see them. And Rasmus is going to get goals. I, I Like, he, he's he's active at the point. He's going to score. They'll come. Yeah, he's... Um, Noah he, Hannafin, yeah, I'm less sure about. Yeah. yeah, Rasmus has been very good this year. I just, it's... It's it's finding that odd, like I mean Milan Lucic has four goals this year. It's finding goals from other places that when the top guys aren't going, they can they have somewhere to go. And I'm not saying this is you, Kevin, but I think a lot of times fans overvalue how many goals defensemen should get. Like I think Noah Hannafin is not the guy that you're looking at as your offensive driver on the blue line, but I think he does a lot of good things. I think he does a lot of good things there that make him valuable, even if he's not scoring. No, that's totally yeah, yeah that's fair. That. That's completely fair. You know, like, if you want him to be scoring goals, put a forward back there. I think defensemen are just that, defensemen, and he's doing a good job of being a defenseman. Yeah. Noah Hannafin gets five goals this season. I'm happy with him, honestly. I mean, I'd like, ideally, I'd like to see both Anderson and Shillington maybe crack double digits. That would be pretty cool. Um, I think that would be a pretty good sign. Um, you know, it was something that we saw in, you know, when in years past when the Flames had Giordano and Hamilton on the defense, and you would see, and even TJ Brody would get up there some years. You know, it's something that we've seen before, and I think it's very possible. But with the rest of them, you know, Zidorov already has two, so that's probably his full season output right there. All right, Coach, I'm done. Yeah, yeah. 
So after this week, the Flames have fallen one spot in the Pacific. They're now third. They have 16 games. They're eight wins, three losses, and five overtime losses. I think that's, what, three more than the whole season last year for 21 total points. Edmonton has 22, and Anaheim has 23. So I would say probably normalizing more back to their mean now at, at third place. Um, but let's chat Shillington. I mean, we were talking about him. This is a guy who played, what, seven games last year all season. Looked like maybe the defensive fodder in a trade or some sort of package. And now, and I said this on Kevin's show last night when I was on the hockey podcast, we were wondering if we'd be okay without Giordano. Well, the man named OK, Oliver Shillington, has come through to to save our butts. And I I don't know, and I'll, I'd be curious to hear your guys' thoughts. I'll ask Mike first. Do you think that Shillington would have had this chance if Giordano didn't leave? It's hard to say. Probably not. Um, and you know, might like, be a, is this sort of a happy accident? Might be a bit of a blessing in disguise, to be sure. Um, but yeah, like it's been quite a revelation, and it's been something that I had hoped would happen. I still don't understand why he played so little last year. I mean, they played Michael Stone three times as many games as Shillington. It just doesn't equate to me. Um, but yeah, no, it's it's. It's it's been everything you could hope for, and honestly, I was I was a little bit surprised that they qualified him as a as an RFA. Not just not because I didn't want them to, but just because I thought the organization was finished with him. That's that's honestly what I thought. I thought that they would just cut their losses. Mike, um, I kind of thought everyone's got a Shillington. You qualify him, and I expect him to be on waivers and sent down. I thought they probably saw value there, but maybe not the NHL level. Yeah, I mean, like. I thought there was a guy there. I thought there was an NHL defenseman there, and but I didn't think that they thought that there was one. And I definitely didn't think that Daryl Sutter would be the guy to unlock him, but I, that was probably foolhardy on my part considering you look back at L.A. and the guys that came up underneath him, guys like Alec Martinez, and uh, you look at guy in, when, his, when he was in Calgary and you saw Jordan Leopold come up. And so y- you think about guys who were able to score on defense and maybe didn't have the most sterling defensive games who were able to find their games under Daryl Sutter, you know, maybe we should have seen this coming, but, um, at the, at, it's impossible to, to say that this wasn't a surprise. Kevin, what do you think? Do you think Oliver Shillington would have had the chance to emerge if Giordano was still in town? No, no, he would not have. Um, and this, this is where I may be, have an unpopular opinion, Um, But I think maybe one of the best things to happen to this team, and I I, want to be careful how I'm saying this, was Gio leaving. And I'm not saying that Gio was a cancer. I think on the ice, I would agree with you. I think there's a lot Gio does behind the scenes that the team still has some holes Oh, for sure. Yeah, but I think think to me, Gio doesn't want to get off the ice. And I think for sure you needed, at, at the very least, you needed to at least reduce his ice time. And I think you're seeing that with the crack, and you can't play him the minutes that you're playing him right now. It's just that's not where he is at at his game. And the other thing about this is it, I think Oliver Shillington wanted to leave. I was thinking that someone would actually throw an offer sheet at him. I was requesting. I thought if I was a team, I would have thrown a little bit of an offer sheet. You didn't have to throw a, like, a yes, Perry Cock and Emmy offer sheet, but, you know. And if you don't even do, what is it, a million and a half, it wouldn't even cost you a draft yeah, pick? Yeah, I, I would have thought the same flame said, okay, thanks, good luck, Oliver. But he, I, he's just, I think, like, his stick word has improved, his speed has improved, his intelligence has improved. Um, it's just, it's been such a revelation What how he came. You'd in. almost think it's a different guy wearing yeah. that jersey. This like, time. I've tweeted a couple of times, I'm wondering, is this Victor Hedman? Like, is Victor Hedman here with the with the Flames? We just have identified him as Oliver Shillington? Yeah. my. I, I guess my, oh, go ahead, Mike. Okay, all right. I was just going to say, my rankings, if I'm going down the list of which Flames have been the best this season, I go Johnny, Markstrom, Shillington. That's all it takes for me to get there. I mean, it's just been unbelievable and I, I think he's been their best defenseman and he's the way that he is playing with the puck has been something that I haven't seen a Flames defenseman do in recent memory absolutely I mean he's, 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 he's probably their best offensive purely offensive defenseman they've had since Dougie Hamilton was traded and uh, That's a fair point. something they've missed absolutely I think. so Mike l- let me toss this at you and then I'll toss it to Kevin is this Oliver Shillington sort of a new man or is this flash in the pan Oliver Shillington who regresses back to a mean I mean maybe if he gets hurt or something but like uh, the way that he's playing right now 
Um, you know, like you don't generally see guys go from number seven to number three or four in you know less than a season. So it makes me think something's got to give. The fact, K, okay, like the the he like in the games that he's played in the past, he's played a couple of half seasons, and in those half seasons that he played, the the fact that he was able to suppress chances when he was on a pairing with a guy who was maybe not an ideal partner at most of those games with a guy like Michael Stone. Um, like the Flames weren't were not a train wreck defensively with Shillington on the ice in those games. Uh, you know he might have he, he might have made some plays that looked bad, but looking at the Forest, he was you know he was capable of playing NHL caliber defense, and that was the reason that I held out hope on him before this season. And so the the fact that he is sort of seeing a progression there. And the offense is just, I think, a factor of him being deployed differently in higher leverage situations and him saying, I'm ready to eat this up. Um, and so we're not seeing Oliver Shillington score on plays that are flukes. I mean, the goal against Philadelphia was lucky, um, but the goal against Toronto is the sort of goal that four guys on the Flames can, can score. Um, and he's making plays that are sustainable in my mind, and he is driving play. The, his underlying numbers are unbelievable. I mean, this isn't this isn't something where we're seeing a guy score points uh, and seeing a team score in spite of him being on the ice. He is absolutely driving. So I am skeptical that this is a flash in the pan. What about you, Kevin? You look at that draft list. Um, and I mean, it's he was drafted in 2015, so he's he's probably at the point where he he is coming into his own. I mean, we have expectations now because we see a Kale Kyle McCarr, a Miro Heiskanen, uh, Quinn Hughes, Victor Hedman, some of these young defensemen that come in and just Adam Fox kind of blow the doors off as soon as they come in. But the reality is, is it takes a long time for defensemen to develop in this league. And it's just well. I mean, you were talking about Hannafin earlier, who I don't even think's met it, got to his peak yet. No, exactly. And he was drafted. I believe. Correct me if I'm wrong. It was 2016. He was drafted. He was drafted well, after. He's younger than Anderson. Year. Yeah. Uh, oh, they, they were the, Hannafin, right. Anderson, Shillington were all the same year. All 2015. Yeah. Right. Hannafin was fifth there. He was in that. He yeah. was in that. Right. So I mean, I, I, I mean, I can only think. I have to think that this is, this is an improvement to some now. Is he going to be a Norris Trophy consistent guy? I don't know, but I certainly do see that there's some real, there's some real talent. I mean, look at even the Ottawa game, the first goal, like his stick on that play, that the pass that he set up for Monahan to Manjapani. I mean, that goal doesn't happen if Shillington doesn't just make a complete simple play there. It's just the intelligence and how he's seeing the game now. It tells me that he's he gets it. Yeah, people mm-hmm. I think have unfairly, you know, you know, maybe criticized Shillington's hockey IQ in the past because he's made, you know, gaffes. And I actually think that's a, I think it's actually the opposite. He is making gaffes or he has made gaffes because maybe his game wasn't there at that point, but like his his raw skills weren't ready to make the plays that he is seeing. I think he's actually a very smart player who sees the ice very very well. And now he is at the point in the NHL where he is a like physically matured enough, and b um, he is being used in the situations where he is able to make the plays that he's been trying to make. Yeah, I agree. Um, and he is at the point where he's able to be successful the majority of the time with those plays. And so we're not seeing him, you know, cough up pucks that, you know, if they had gone through in past seasons, would have led to scoring chances for him. He, he's actually getting those pucks through, and. I think honestly, it's just a progression. It's it's a pure progression thing. And I, if I was working for the Flames, which I don't, thankfully, but if I was doing it, I would really be in conversation with his agent right now. Um, well, I, that was going to be my next question. So, Mike, if you're the GM here, you're the heir apparent to Boston Pizza. You're running this team. You got to pay this guy next year. He's an RFA. What does that contract look like? He's seven hundred fifty now. You're not getting him for under a million. I take. Oh, no kidding. Uh, I take a risk with this contract because I feel like if I hit on the contract, uh, it has a potential to be uh, an absolute banger of a contract. What what would that look like to you? What do you think you get signed for next year? Six years. I'd go maybe... Six years at how much? Four to five range. That's what I'd go at. 
What about you, Kevin? Um, on, I, I mean, we were asking for the comparable. Maybe the comparable is right on the team. Maybe it's Erasmus. It's it's five at four point five. Six, and I was saying this when I was on the hockey yeah. podcast, Mike, is I think if he goes to arbitration, it's tough to find a comparable for him. Yeah, there's not a lot of de- there's not a lot of defensemen who are 24. He'll be, and I think he'll be 25 when this deal ends, who sign two year deals because that walks them straight to UFA. And yeah. so I think the Flames would be foolish to go that short. I mean, you, you you're just I mean, like where where is the upside there? Because you know, like if he keeps if he keeps you know going up, then you're just gonna have to pay him more. Um, and I, I, I mean, maybe if you're expecting him to regress, but you gotta, at a certain point, you just gotta take, take these bets. I mean, imagine what the Flames would have done if they had locked up Andrew Mangiapane to a six or seven yeah. year deal when his last contract expires. After he'd already scored 17 goals in 50 games, and in the previous season had scored something like eight goals in his final 25 games, you know, that was a time where I, if I was a GM, I would have said, okay, let's take a bet. And if it works out, which it would have, uh, we're going to look really smart and have a guy locked in for all of his good years. That's the other mm-hmm. thing here, is if I delay extending Shillington, when I finally go long term with him in a couple of years, that's when I'm going to have to sign a contract where I'm eating up years that maybe I don't want to have. Whereas exactly. if I go long term now, I get him until he's 30 or 31. And that's probably when I would want to trade him anyway. Yeah, Kevin, you mentioned earlier maybe the Flames wouldn't qualify him. Do you think we get a bit of a discount for the loyalty? Well, here this is this is sort of what I'm thinking just in terms of big picture and why I'm going RAS at this point. I mean, it, I see your point, but I I mean I think it's easy. We've talked Dan and I have had the chat about what we pay Matthew Kachuk. I mean, that's easy to find that money. It's 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 in Zadorov and Gabrans, and you you probably are not bringing back. But where the problem here is, what are you paying Johnny next year? And yeah. I mean, it's and yeah, and that's the only the, issue I think. Where would you find that five million on next year's roster? Like, if yeah. you could yeah. bridge Oliver Shillington at a four point five, and you know, legitimate, there is a legitimate argument that he hasn't proved it yet. The his argument would be is that it's a defense market, and he he probably has a lot going for him. But he's also RFA, so I mean, he's not going to be UFA on the open market. Calgary could qualify him. Um, and and you'd have to offer sheet him. And again, if you're getting that much of an offer sheet for him, I don't know. He's going to get offer sheeted by another team at four five. Yeah, I think there's enough other UFAs that I that I would go after, not want to give up the picks. Well, here, let me ask two two questions here. Let me just throw this in this situation because I, I I I agree with Mike that I mean I think I I I kind of see the high point, but is the fact that he's playing with Chris Tanev. A help, or do we think if Oliver Shillington was playing with Rasmus Anderson, we would be seeing the same thing? I think Tanev's helping him definitely, um, but like I think you know the evidence with I think Anderson is a guy who is capable of playing, providing a similar amount of value as Tanev at his at when Anderson is at his best. Uh, which we haven't always seen. Anderson last season uh, was not very good, I didn't think, for most of the last season. It's the story of this whole team um, last year, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, you know, and Anderson's another guy who's maturing, right? And, uh, you know, Tanev's not going anywhere for now. Uh, still got two more years. And, uh, you know, it, it is it is worth asking. And I, I, I would keep those two locked at the hip, like, right... No, no way I'm breaking up that pairing, probably for you know, until after the calendar year, like the, 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 until 2022 and probably longer than that. Um, you know, I'm not breaking up what's working, but you know, with Oliver, it's, it's hard to say, you know, it it really is hard to say. It's, it's, it's something where he has been competent when he's been with lesser defensemen, significantly lesser defensemen than Tanov. Um, so putting him in the middle ground, I think, yeah, I would just need to see it. But in terms, I mean, of our highest the... paid defensemen are Hannafin at four nine and Anderson at four five five yeah. and Tanev at four five. I think if you're going to go with this guy, I don't think you can go the same level as Tanev and Anderson. Like I think, especially on his first really good year, I think you top out of this at like three three and a half. Uh, it's hard to say. I don't think he takes it. I don't think he I takes don't it think because he does he's either. so close. Here's the thing, though. Like Anderson and Hannafin both signed those deals 
um, uh, 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 way earlier. Uh, they signed them when they were. They had to buy up so many. They had to buy up a ton of RFA years before they got to the UFA. And the thing with Tanev is he was far from being a sure bet when he signed that contract. Uh, his last couple of years in Vancouver were rough. They weren't. They weren't what they he weren't. was doing uh, earlier in his career. Um, and there was a lot of evidence to suggest that maybe Quinn Hughes... But he also Hughes, paid EFA premium on tennis. That is true, yeah. But there was also a lot of evidence to suggest that Quinn Hughes was the one who was sort of driving a lot more of that pairing than Tanev was. Um, and obviously Tanev has been a revelation in Calgary. Um, and so, you know, I, I still think, though, that Shillington is probably going to ask for, uh, you know, I, I can't see him going lower than four. Def- I, I, I think that's a... I don't... But what I will say uh, is... In terms of finding the money, uh, Milan Lucic is probably going to be very... I'm not going to say very easy to trade this offseason, because that's never, you know, that's never... Trades are never easy, but a Milan Lucic trade becomes a lot more feasible after July 1st, 2022. Do you think you'd have to take back bad salary? Do you think you can move that out for and bring nothing back? I think it is critical that they potentially move an asset to move Lucic. Um, and I think there are teams that will very gladly entertain that especially if you look at teams that are maybe more financially moribund uh, because Lucic next season counts for 5.25 against the cap but he makes less than a million um, after his signing bonus is paid out on July 1st and his no trade clause expands well it actually contracts uh, and he can be traded to 10 teams without his consent um, so I think there's actually a very realistic possibility where the Flames find that money by moving Lucic, especially if, you know, he continues as a guy who is a 20, 25 point guy with decent defense because GMs will always value guys like Milan Lucic. And I well, and GMs, some of them will put a premium on a guy with who has the kind of playoff experience he's got too. And I could even see... If they move the right guy with them, that could even be a deadline move if they needed it Maybe. to be. Yeah, honestly, getting like well, and you look at what Tampa Bay did. Um, but but that being said, if you move them at the deadline, you're retaining. Salary. You'll have to give up more to make that happen at the deadline, and you're retaining salary because you're trading them yeah. to a contender, and contenders don't have the cap space. Yeah, uh, and no. honestly, I think Lucic probably has his most value to a cheap team at his full salary because that gets them five five and a quarter closer to the floor without them even having to commit a million dollars of real money to them. Uh, that's something that we've seen so a that lot. that means that's he's an off Ottawa, to Arizona. An Arizona, a, uh, you know, and Arizona is probably... He goes from playing with one Kachuk to the other off to Ottawa. Yeah, mm-hmm. I wouldn't want to do that, but yeah. Well, no, I, I think that could be very feasible, and that would free up that money and still give you some left over. I mean, you're not paying... Which Kachuk? You're, you're not going to you're not gonna end up paying uh, Shillington 5.2, so that... You know, you pay him what he needs, and then you got some money to sign the other guys you need, or but, at least but, cap space. Sign the okay, other guys I know that but this this does play into the conversation a little bit, and I do have a second question about Oliver. But what are we paying Johnny? Like, wait, we got that blank check that Twitter is saying. Okay, here's a blank check, Johnny. What are we hoping? What are we praying next yeah, year? Yeah, what are we paying him? That's a tough one. What do you think, you Mike? Know that scene in Ferris Bueller, uh, where the teacher. Or not the teacher, the principal uh, says that Ferris has been absent nine times. Uh, I would go nine times seven, or maybe even more than nine times wow. seven. I would go maybe even up to nine point five times seven, or even maybe even a little bit higher than that. But you know, I think losing Johnny is uh, it would be the the sword through the heart. It would be I if I lose Johnny in free agency, I immediately start a rebuild. I don't see. I don't see the uh, the future of a team that's led by Matthew Kachuk. As much as I like Matthew Kachuk, I don't see... I think see... especially after letting the last icon in Jerome McGinley go for virtually nothing. I mean, we got, you know, pittance for that. I don't think this team can do that again. Oh, God. If you lose Johnny for nothing, like if you don't even get any assets for him, ugh. That would if we you, get Poirier and Klimchuk again, that, well, even if, but if you get nothing, like if he walks in free agency, why? Well, I, I don't think I think Tree's smart enough not to let him go for nothing. I mean, if he doesn't think he's going to be able to sign him, I think there's a there could be a deadline move. Well, he let Mark Giordano go for nothing, and you know, I. I but that was a different scenario, right? Was. That was a that was the expansion draft. But at the same time, I mean, you're looking at the guys who they had available. 
I think there's a very real scenario. Like, they, there were so many defensemen who were traded leading up to the expansion draft. But that's a completely different discussion. But um, What do you think his deal is, Kevin? Who, Johnny's? Um, yeah. I... It's hard not to go nine. It's hard not to go what Mike said. Um, but the question is, is do you want two players on your team with $9 million? Um, because, I mean, look at, there are teams, there's a team in out east of the center of the universe that has four people, four players in that over $10 million range. And it's, mm -hmm. it's tough cap-wise, but to me, I think that's what you have to do. But then the next question with Oliver that I have is... And I don't think that this is ridiculous. Maybe you do. But we've already talked about, there's talk about Monge on the Olympic team. What if Oliver Shillington is on the Swedish Olympic team? I delved into this um, a little bit. I, I took a look at it completely uh, serendipitously a, a few days ago. And I would love it. I don't think it's going to happen. I, I think, like, with Oliver, um, he, he plays for the worst possible team to be able to get on their Olympic team. Because if he was Finnish, he'd be on it, absolutely. Uh, if he was Russian, he'd definitely be on it. Russia does not have many good defensemen. But Sweden, I think he would struggle to be in the top four on their second team, as good as he is. Because the guys who they have, I mean, Hedman Carlson is guaranteed to be their top pairing. Uh, they've got uh, Hampus Lindholm. They've got... Uh, John Klingberg, they've got uh, Oliver ekman Larson, who they're probably going to take even if he's not that great anymore. Uh, they've got Jonas Brodin, they've got probably Rasmus Anderson, who they would take before they took Shillington. Um, I think Shillington only makes it if there's a big injury. I think yeah. Shillington only makes it if there's three big injuries. Like that's how that's how deep Sweden is as a, as a country. They are they are outside of Canada and maybe the states, but I'm not even convinced on the states. Sweden has the deepest drop of defensemen. It's going to be so difficult for Shillington to crack that team. Yeah, and I, on the know, left side. And that's the the thing that I that you know if if he somehow makes that Olympic team, that makes this contract negotiation a lot tougher because he has... If he makes the Olympic team, his next contract starts with a six, yeah. I think. It, like, it, it's, it, yeah. Yeah. Well, we've, we've talked about the emergence of one defenseman, and why don't we talk about the other one? Mike, you uh, tweeted this week about uh, Yuzo Valimaki and his quote in a... What was this? This was a... Uh, Finnish news, Finnish magazine. Now, admittedly, I found this somewhere else, um, and then I just took and like uh, I just saw the article posted somewhere else by somebody, and I I, I didn't see it on Twitter, so I just uh, posted it there too. Um, so I, I I don't really have an RSS feed that chronicles all the latest Finnish news, but I just sort of so the upon the it. quote here that you you did the scientific thing of going to Google Translate and translating it to English and. I guess the quote here translated to English from Valimaki is, there have been so many games in recent years due to injuries that now it feels pretty stupid that I'm healthy and wouldn't be able to play, but it is not a given. So he's obviously frustrated that uh, he's not playing in the lineup here. Um, if we're talking about, you know, freeing up money, do you guys think that Yusuf Valimaki, if he's not in the lineup, is staying aflame, or do you think that's a piece that uh, we might be trying to move out? I don't think they're going to be hasty on moving Valimaki. I only think they're going to be moving Valimaki if there's another guy who they really like who is of similar pedigree who becomes available, and he is the price to get him. Uh, and I don't know who that guy would be, but there are a lot either. of high prospects in recent years who have had sort of um, ups and downs in the NHL, guys like Vitaly Kravitsov and guys like Barrett Hayton. Uh, guys who you know have that pedigree of being top ten picks in the NHL, uh, and Valimaki's shown both shown more in the NHL than both those guys. Um, you know, uh, Valimaki at his at his, what he is currently is a capable bottom pairing defenseman, and that's sort of sort of the same story as as Shillington almost, uh, although a little bit more reserved in his demeanor on the ice. Um, and I think we can both, or all three of us, agree that Zadorov Good Branson is not our bottom two pairing next year. Like, oh, there's probably going to be room for uh, Yuso to join the lineup. What do you think, Kevin? Yeah, it, it's it's tough because I don't feel that Valimaki. I I don't feel Valimaki's quite NHL ready. Like I, 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 but I think that there's a lot of potential. I really wish that he could be in Stockton. I think that that's the best place for him right now. Him being seventh, a seventh defenseman, um, isn't good for him. And I, 
But, I mean, it's not like Zadorov has played well. It's like, I'm trying to word this. But Zadorov's much more of a Daryl Sutter yeah, player, quote-unquote. Yeah, he, quote, he absolutely like. fits what Daryl Sutter is looking for, and Valimaki isn't at this point. Um, I would loathe to trade Valimaki at this point unless you're getting a high, high, high-end top six forward. I agree. I would be low to do it. Like I just for the and I think if we were slotting, correct me if I if you guys think differently, but I think at the beginning of the season when we slotted defensemen, we probably had Valimaki in and Good Branson out. And I think this could be one of those things where you know what Valley's just got to outplay Good Branson. Yeah, and I'm not convinced that Good Branson is honestly long for the lineup. I mean, he's been good to start the season objectively. Uh, I think so. Um, you know, I think he has provided the team with value in his own end, which is something that I never thought would happen. Um, but we're, we're already starting to see signs of things Cracks coming a armor. little bit down to earth. And I, Zadorov has experience playing on the right side. And I think there is a possibility that we end up actually seeing a Valimaki Zadorov pairing at some point, um, which I wouldn't probably hate. Um, I don't know. I mean, you can't break up either of the top two pairings right now. And no, and, and I think that could be good for Valimaki's game. I think if Zadorov can, can you know, play the body and be the heavy on that, I think it could give Valimaki a lot of freedom. Mm-hmm. They just got to get Valimaki skating back up. And I don't know if it's having him work with a skating coach, but... Um, his mobility is, has become an issue. I they think. have a skating coach on staff this year now, don't yeah. they? Yeah, well, I'm sure they do. I, I'm honestly sure they do, but maybe even like just what's, getting him one-on-one time or something. What, what's her is, name? I, uh, I, I know who you're talking about. I'll look it up while yeah. you give us your thoughts, Kevin. Where do you think? Uh, how do you think we get Valimaki back in the lineup? Uh, yeah, it's got to be one of Good Bradson and Zadorov out of the lineup. You're not breaking up the top four, um, so it's either it's either an injury or the other getting Valimaki in, but I guess the other problem, the other math issue here is Michael Stone. And I just wonder if Michael Stone is ahead of Valimaki if you're moving Gabranson out. You put Michael Stone in there against because Sutter was a huge fan of Michael Stone last year. The only thing about Stone is I think he's one of these guys that is a quintessential seven eight because he can show us that he can step back in if not playing for a while and still look good. Like he's not the kind of guy I think you need to keep in the lineup to keep fresh. No, yeah, I, no, but I just I don't know. I I just. Danielle Fujita yeah. is the name you're looking for. Yeah, it certainly doesn't feel like Daryl Sutter and Yusuf Valimaki are on the same page. That's for sure. And that's the only reason I'm wondering if, while the Flames might not want to trade Valley, do you think Valley's going to want out? Like, do you think he's going to say, I don't want to play for Daryl, Daryl's not using me, I want out of here. Well, he's, he's already talking to Finnish newspapers about how he's uh, unhappy with Well, that's it. And, and I can't see that sitting well with the Flames no. of him saying it's stupid. Yeah, I don't think – I don't think – I mean, it could be a mistranslation again. But, um, uh, all, I mean, with Oliver – Google made a mistake? Well, yeah, the yeah, translation of that – Note the date and time. Did you, did, yeah. you guys – if you saw the translation of that, and I would recommend the listeners do that, it was quite humorous. <laughs> Actually. Yeah, the, the, the full Google translate of that article is has some uh, oddities, I would say. Um, but yeah, like we, we, we didn't really see the same, um, the same, uh, 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 grievances filed by Oliver Shillington, uh, when he was out of the lineup in past seasons. Um, and I, I mean, he's been, he's, he's, he's been at times slow to sign. Uh, and I, I don't doubt that there have probably been some disagreements between him and various coaches, but we haven't seen something quite so public like we're, we're seeing from Bellamy. And the last time we did was probably Bennett, who or they Michael honored Froelich. his wish and moved him out. Yeah, or Michael Froelich. Um, yep. Yeah, and, and, you know, there are enough guys who are attractive trade targets. I honestly don't think the Flames are going to be as quiet this year. I think they're finally going to finish a deal, which... Maybe it seems like wishful thinking, but I think they're finally going to get somebody to supplement this core in case this is Johnny's last season. Um, because I think they I think they do think very highly of what they can be at their top end. And I do too. I think they are capable of controlling games on a consistent basis. So I think they're going to get some help. And if they get some help, they're not, I don't think they're going to move Matt Coronado. I don't think they're going to move Connor Zary. I don't think they're, I don't think they're going to be quick to move Jacob Pelichet. No. I think Yusuf Valimaki is going to be the guy they try and move, along with probably a first-round pick, um, to try and land somebody. And if it's there, if they're in contention closer to February, I don't think they'll have much issue moving their first for this season, um, especially because the top end this year isn't supposed to be quite as strong as the top end next year. 
Um, and there are guys. I think it's it's something that we could see. And, and I think Valimaki can get you a decent return. Yeah. Well, even, There's always that GM that wants a young, you know, defensive prospect with high upside. Well, yeah. Fl- Florida got went after it, went and got Ole Olevi. Maybe maybe they see a project in Valimaki as well. I I'm no don't think that they're comparable, but that's just I'm just going to throw that out there. You levy, man. I I don't know. Uh, he's he he he's he is, he's only played one AHL game since that trade. He, I mean, here's the thing though. The issues with Valimaki and Yulevi are similar, in that their mobility is the big question, um, and they have both been injured and had lower body injuries that have affected their their mobility. Now I think Valimaki's floor is a lot higher than Yulevi's floor, I agree. Uh, which is something that you, Vancouver was probably not hoping for when they picked him in the top five. Um, but yeah, like I think Valimaki at this point, at his worst, is a capable NHL defenseman, whereas Yulevi is not. Um, and so you know, it's funny you mentioned the injuries. Like this, and I've been saying for a few years in this show is I think that the injuries to Valley have changed his upside, and I think we're starting to see that coming true this year. That he maybe doesn't have the upside we thought. I think he's a capable, you know, NHLer, but is he the capable maybe top two or three that we thought he'd be? Yeah, I mean, it's 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 hard to say. It's really hard to say until he gets more playing time. I'm loath just into the first round pick. I'm loath to give up a first round pick this year, mm-hmm. considering how deep this draft is. Yeah, but depend. But you got to give to get at the same yeah, time. Yeah, but I also the other high in Senate, and this is what I was going to say is I think that some GMs would be very intrigued to get that first round pick in this draft mm-hmm. if they can. So it might yeah. be an easy appeal. Yeah, but I mean, last year we saw draft picks, you know, going for cheap because everyone knew the draft was kind of a crapshoot. Um, but I think this year, I think you're right, Kevin. There's enough. The Flames will be in an interesting position where I think that pick might go for more than you usually see a pick of that round go, especially with the draft the way it is and having more scouting time this year. Yeah, well, and it depends on which player they're targeting. Obviously, like I mean, a team I could see them very easily hooking up with on a deal is Montreal. Uh, Montreal is not going to make the playoffs this year, and they have a lot of players who. Montreal seems to overvalue their guys, though. This is true, um, but they have they have guys who I'd be very interested in in acquiring, and 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 there are guys who you could get from Montreal who you might be able to give up Valimaki and not much else to get. Um, maybe a guy like uh, who's really experiencing a resurgence lately is Jonathan Drouin, uh, or a guy like. Uh, I mean, it's hard to say. A lot of Montreal's guys are locked up on on contracts that are not very appealing. But a guy like Tyler Toffoli, uh, who Daryl had in L.A., uh, is a guy who maybe you don't. It's hard to say though, right? Because like, and there's been rumors of him coming to Calgary before Daryl. It's too. true. Um, now, is Valimaki too much to give up for a guy like Toffoli? That's the question, right? Because like Toffoli is. I mean, he has he has two years left after this one on his deal. Um, and he's. But, I guess depends how you look at Valimaki, though. I mean, if we look at him right now, you're giving up a seventh defenseman for, you know, let's say a top six. I think if you look at where they both are in the lineup, that's a hell of a deal for Calgary. Well, and the thing is, it gives you the ability to ice a top nine that I feel, personally, has zero guys who are likely to be liabilities on any given night. Like, you have a third line where you're able to maybe put Backlund, Coleman, Dubé on it, and you have, or, or you know, maybe you have a Kachuk, Monaghan, Mangiapane, Gaudreau, Lindholm, Toffoli. I mean, there are so many goals. I mean, that that is yeah. that is something where the Flames are so in need of finishing talent that getting a guy like Toffoli, who scored 28 goals in the shortened season last year, I mean, that's just something that, you know, that I think that would have a lot of value for them. And Kevin, I, I agree with you about giving up the first round pick, but I also think that if you look at a lot of top teams, most of them do put that pick in play. And I think if Calgary thinks... They can make it work. I'm okay with putting that pick and play as long as it's going to get us past round one. If we give it up and we're one and done again, then it looks like a big failure. True. If there was one Canadian I would be interested in on that forward group, it would be Joel Armia. He's 3.4, so less than Toffoli, a little longer, but a year younger. Um, I think he can. I don't know if he's a pure goal scorer, but I think, like... I think, and I don't know that we need another pure goal scorer. I think we need a guy with a bit of a, uh, you know, something more to his game. The other name I was just going to toss out there, and I'm just thinking at this from a Vancouver perspective. So just, just hear me out here. Um, I, I don't know if this would work, but what, what about Brock Besser? Bingo. I don't think. 
Love I, I just think that the cost of acquisition on Besser is going to be way too high. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if I agree. I'm I'm, I'm not sure if I agree. Uh, if you can, I think there's going to be a number of suitors that sort of like the Eichel deal might push the price too high. If you can get Brock Besser, and if you can send out a guy of equal or similar salary, because uh, what does Besser make right now? He makes uh, se- so five, Kevin. What does the five. Besser deal look like to you? What do you give up to get Besser? I give up a first for Besser. Do you want just a first? You know what I do? I do. I What's do. That, I do. Lucic Valimaki first, second. Wow. I I don't think they would. Well, I mean, it's if if betting's still there, you might be able to offer a horse, a cow, a couple of trucks, and a first for Besser. Yeah. But he is an RFA. That's the and the other Grandland and the other yes, and Michael Stone. Uh, mm-hmm. But he is an the other Stone. He is an RFA. And from the Canucks perspective, you got to give Hoglander. You're in the situation where you got to give Hoglander some more ice time. You've got a couple of other kids that you're coming up. They are definitely going to need to build through that draft again. Um, and he, I don't know. I think that the nice thing about Besser is he's a right shot, which we desperately that's, need. That's what's appealing about that idea. Now I know that you know I don't know if the Flames and Canucks would trade, but that's that's an interesting. Flames and Canucks have traded enough times. The other guy I wanted to toss out there that just may be interesting. What about Clayton Keller in Arizona? Mm, now we're getting into an area where I know more because <laughs> I, I I read about the Coyotes over at Five for Howling, and uh, I think the Coyotes would absolutely part with Clayton Keller in the right deal. Um, he's- and you know that could be. I mean, if that's a team that needs to take on some cap floor, that could be where you move Lucci. It's out. possible. Um, yeah, Keller is a very appealing player to me. Uh, I'd also look at Nick Schmaltz. Uh, yeah, at center. yeah. The too. guy who, the guy who uh, I would be first on my board is Jacob Chikrin. Um, and I know they have balked at the possibility of moving Chikrin before. Um, but if you're moving out Valimaki in a deal and you're getting a defenseman back, and if you can have a left hand, or even honestly, you know, yeah, no, it'd be Valimaki, but. Um, yeah, like like Chikrin is the guy who has the goal scoring ability from the point that the Flames. So where do you put Chikrin then? Yeah, is he, do you move someone out of your top four? Yeah, I would. Yeah, I would do that. Uh, that's that's something, you move that's, out? that's something where I think that would be a precursor to a move where I move Noah Hannafin for a scoring winger. Um, that's, that's so you bring him in to replace Hannafin, then yeah. you move Hannafin. You don't move out. Hannafin in the same deal because Arizona has no interest in Noah Hannafin. Um, but that's something where if I'm trading with 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 Arizona, so you bring you bring Chickering in to allow you to, yeah. to move hands. That's something out. I would do in the off season probably. Um, but or honestly, uh, I don't know. It's it's hard to say. But um, yeah, that's that's something where if Arizona, because Arizona, honestly, their window is probably not going to be for a little while, and Chickering's probably. You guys gonna tell be me you don't old. want Phil Kessel. Phil, <laughs> if the if the Flames are going to trade for an aging winger, I would rather them get Dustin Brown than Phil Kessel. Yeah, I just I wouldn't. I mean, he's won a cup, but I just don't. I don't think he's got. Well, to me, we've we've got that guy. That guy on our team is Lucic. Yeah, compared to Kessel, I mean, yeah, yeah, Lucic has Kessel beat when it comes to shooting five hole. Um, but uh, I would say, yeah, Kessel is probably cooked uh, or close to it at this point. Um, you know, maybe if they were signing him for cheap, then I'd be for it. Um, but he's still got one year left on his deal and it's going to, yeah, be... you don't want to inherit that deal. And it's, it's, I don't think Calgary's the right destination for him, to be honest. I think Me he neither. needs a team that, um, maybe isn't as fast, you know, or like they like, cause if Kessel's going to score in Calgary, like if they if they get Kessel, they're probably going to want to put him on a line with Johnny or Mangiapane, and he just doesn't have the speed. Like it would be it would be it would be like watching somebody That'd be terrible. running behind a car. But yeah, the one other so Kevin, you mentioned the oh go I ahead. just one other team. I'm just going to put something out there in 2022 2023. The only defenseman that the Buffalo Sabers have signed is Rasmus Dahlin. Mm-hmm. Do they have a couple of players? I mean, I know like you're not getting Dylan Cousins out of there, I don't think. But they're. I wonder what they would be interested in. I wonder what you would take to get Tage Thompson out of there. I don't think it would take uh, Valimaki to get Tage Thompson. I think it would take less um, because like Thompson is having a good start. 
Um, but there was probably a time last year where Buffalo tried to move Thompson and couldn't because he had a really rough season. And he had a rough season the year before that, too. I think, honestly, at this point, Thompson needs to stay in Buffalo um, because I think it's the only way. He's he's finally in a groove. I, if I was Tage yeah. Thompson, I wouldn't want to move right now. And no, was, and he's also playing first-line minutes there, which yeah. he's not going to get if he goes somewhere else. No, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm a little skeptical of Tage Thompson. The guy that I but, – but, I mean, he's a, I think he's a good player. But the guy who I'm looking at if I'm trading with Buffalo is um, is uh, 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 Victor Olofsson. Um, because I mean, that's a guy who's 26, uh, pending RFA arbitration rights. That's a guy who I think is tailor made to sign a one year deal and just go straight to UFA uh, if he doesn't get traded. Um, because Olafson does not line up with whatever Buffalo's window is going to be at all. Um, similar situation to uh, to Besser, if you ask me, in terms of you know where they are on teams that probably aren't going anywhere fast, pending RFAs, scoring wingers. That's sort of the same, uh, uh, sort of the same hamburger right there. The other team that we mentioned earlier that I think it probably is a young defenseman is the Dallas Stars. Yeah, I could see it. I mean, so I mean, you know, I could I could see I could actually Valimaki fitting in very well there, maybe with Essa Lindell, uh, Mira Heiskanen. Like I could see him kind of fitting that sort of there. I think Klingberg is over over his head there on the first pairing, and I could see them wanting to move some guys around. Um, but what do you want out of Dallas in return? Number ninety-one. I want Tyler Sagan. That's that is that is my target. I mean, I don't know how many years Sagan has left on his deal, but if there is somebody who you can get from Dallas who has the ability, oh my god! Uh, never mind. I don't want Tyler Sagan. He's. Yeah, I was gonna say. Are you deal. sure? It's like it's it's like. Oh until... my goodness. Yeah. What are they? Th- no, okay. Then never mind. I don't want to say. Sagan's anything. got nine point eight five for, for I think six like six more years. Se- seven, six more years. Okay, yeah. I, didn't, I didn't know that. Um, yeah, I don't want to say. If anything. you bring in Sagan, you have to say goodbye to one of the other contracts yeah, we I don't we want to sign. I don't want Sagan anymore. Uh, okay. I mean, okay. What do you it, think, Kevin? It just Kevin? depends on what Dallas. Just one second. It just it just depends on what Dallas thinks they are. If Dallas thinks that Rick Bonus can get this team back to the Stanley Cup final immediately, then they're not going to trade a guy like Rope Hintz, and they're not going to trade a guy like Denny Gurionov. But if they think they're close to being done, those two guys are the guys that I want. I wouldn't mind. I mean, I don't know what it would take, and I, if it's too much, I would say no. But I don't think it would hurt to have Joe Pavelski in this lineup. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would. He love is a Joe UFA. Pavelski. It would be a rental. It would be a pure rental. I don't think you're signing him next year. But yeah, Pavelski, Pavelski, absolutely, I agree. Or, with that. or, or the Russian god Alexander Radulov. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think Pavelski makes more sense. Um, just I because... don't think that that necessarily becomes your Valamaki move, but no. I think you could get Pavelski near the, you know, mid-season near the deadline for not much. Pavelski for a second and I don't know some. Yeah, I, I, I think, uh, I think that makes a lot of sense, um, especially when. You consider that maybe Pavelski's a guy who could theoretically slot in on the wing if if things go poorly. I mean, or or if or if, if if the Flames just aren't ready to move one of their centers out of out of uh, the middle at that point in time. I mean, and Pavelski, I mean, high volume shooter. So that's something that I think the Flames would really covet, definitely. I agree. We t- and I mentioned this earlier, and I, I mean, I think the price will be high, but I can see guys starting to want out of uh, Chicago, and the only guy that I might want from there is Dominic Kubalik, but I think that the price is going to be high to get him. I mean, they're not moving Kirby Doc. Uh, I don't. I think Kane and Taves, there'd be a bidding war for mi- middling teams who want a, a name. I can see a team like Seattle want to bring in a name there. Um, they're not moving Strom. You don't want Gaudette. I think the brink, they, it's not going anywhere. I think they very, they very easily could move Strom because Strom has fallen out of favor. Um, yeah, Strom you know, would like, be Strom. Strom's a piece I could move for sure. Yeah, I think I think I think Strom is possible, um, but you know I, I'm I'm a little skeptical of Strom. Uh, Kubalik is yeah like again, I think if you move for Strom, you move for him as a depth piece. You're not bringing Strom in as a top, as a you know top six. Eh, I mean I'm not sure. I mean Strom is it, when Strom has been with. When Strom has been with Kane in full seasons, it's uh, it's it's been positive. There have been a lot of points. Um, I guess the way I look at those, who do you take out of our top six to put Strom in? 
good point, right? Yeah, I, I, I do agree with you there. I right? like he could be a top six, but who who is he? Is he better? He's a center. Is he better than Monahan? Is he better than Backlund? Mm. Is he better than Lindholm? Yeah, I I would be just thinking about this. I know Chicago is going to be on a selling spree, but I would avoid it of all I can because I think the name that's going to get out is Jonathan Taze. I think that that's the guy that they're going to end up having to move, and I just think that that is a PR disaster waiting to happen. I can I can see Flurry getting out of there and maybe going to Edmonton. I wonder if it's Flurry and I, and they take a shot at Jonathan Taze if the Oilers do. And <laughs> I don't know what the Oilers have to give you back for those two pieces. Uh, it would be funny if they traded Evan Bouchard. Um, but, uh, I mean, yeah, I don't want any part of Jonathan Taves in Calgary. No, um, I don't. I don't either. Ed- Edmonton, uh, I mean, they got pieces, I guess. Uh, Tyler Benson uh, <laughs> and Philip Broberg. I mean, I don't really. I don't. It would be funny uh, if, if Edmonton gave up Evan Bouchard. But, uh, yeah, I mean, look, I, I don't think – yeah, I I think I don't think Taves and Kane make any sense for Calgary and you know, no. on the ice on the ice or off the ice. I think Dylan Strom has maybe some intrigue if they put him on the wing, maybe or um, like like maybe he could hit it off with Mangiapane. Um But like, it's it's hard to say. I don't love any of Chicago's pieces to be honest. Me neither. No, they're that's going to be a team that's going to be in the ditch for a long time. They need to start over. Yeah. Uh, they need to ditch everything, get everybody out of there, get a new logo, get a new... Get I See, and I, I'm the guy that said that, Mike. I've said this, I think, on Kevin's podcast and on ours. You're seeing all these teams with Native American imagery yeah. rebranding. Now is the time for Chicago to rebrand. Oh, they, need to, the, yeah. they need to do what? what the Portland Winterhawks did and just... He stole yeah. the words right out of my mouth. Yeah. Yeah. Portland, Portland's new logo is fantastic. I mean, it's they just the need to become the later. Chicago Hockey Club. Yeah, honestly, I kind of like that name for Washington. <laughs> it's kind of unique. Too. But you know, I think that this is the time to shed the Blackhawks name, logo, colors, and go something brand new and say Chicago Blackhawks are behind us. We're now the Chicago whatevers. Chicago cookies. The Chicago hot dogs. Yeah, the Chicago isotopes. There you go. Ice spelled I C E. Well, I, I think the old Kootenai Ice logo they could probably buy for cheap. Probably. Because it's Chicago Ice. Yeah. Yeah, no. There's a lot of different possibilities, but for now on the ice, you know. Oh. And Seth Jones's contract hasn't even started yet. And, and they bad. Can you imagine if it if Columbus gets the first pick and it's Shane Wright? That turns out to be one of the worst trades in history. Well, I think is is that pick not lottery? I think there might be a lottery protection on it's that. It's lottery pick. protected, I think. I think yeah. it's oh, top it? two though. I think it's top two. Um, so, I mean, yeah, it can't, yeah, like, I think, um, but, like, if they get, like, an Elias Pettersson talent out of that pick, it, it I mean, it's already horrible. That it's a horrible It's already just, yeah. just, just despicable, um, for, for Chicago, but, um, you know, even, like, losing Adam Boakvist to begin with, but, yeah. So last current events question I want to ask you guys are current flames. It's something that Kevin brought up earlier, and that's getting number 88 going. We've seen him play all over the lineup. This is a guy who's on Canada's long list for the Olympics and feels like he should be playing higher in the lineup than he is. Kevin, you mentioned this earlier. What do you do to get uh, Manjipani going and get him more ice time? I mean, I think it would be ideal if we can get him on the number one power play, but Mike is right. Sean, like the way the number one power play is working – you don't want to switch anything out at this point. Um, you have him penalty kill uh, already. Um, and you don't want to change the top line five on five either. You don't want to break up that Johnny Lindholm Kachuk line, I don't think, at this point. I actually, I'm not sure if I agree right now. Uh, I think that line has gotten a little bit tepid. Um, and I mean, it's a line that is a very easy fallback line. Uh, but it's at the point where I would almost look at maybe trying to get Kachuk to drive his own line. Because um, I, I think there's a bit of a... I, I worry sometimes that Kachuk kind of becomes a passenger when he's on a line with two players who are better than him or or equal to him. And I think the best Kachuk might be the Kachuk that we've seen who leads the charge on a line. Um, and I'm almost wondering... So what do you think in top line then is Johnny Lindholm and Lindholm, Mon- Hear me out. Monch? I think I think I go Johnny Lindholm and Blake Coleman on the top line. 
And because uh, Coleman, I think, don't Coleman and Lindholm kill penalties together? I think they do. And um, and uh, Coleman's a guy who's played on a first line before in New Jersey, and he has some score. I mean, he's gonna start scoring. He's he, the play driving has been really good. The goals are gonna mm-hmm. come. Um, I'm not worried about that. And I think that's that. I think that's the guy who I'd look at. And then the second and line. And then your second line is Kachuk, Monahan, and Majibani. Yeah, that's what I do. Uh, and you know, any line with Matthew Kachuk on it is going to get a lot of five on five minutes. Um, and I don't want to break up Monahan and Majibani at this point. I agree. Um, I think they're playing pretty well together. And so that's that's the change that I make. Is I. And I can see yeah. that. I think Kachuk's also good at drawing a lot of heat towards himself, and I think he could give uh, Sean and Andrew a lot more time and space because he can take you know a lot of that heat in the offensive zone. Yeah. And and if 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 that fails, just one sec, Kevin. One if that fails, that the the change that I then make is I switch Coleman and Mangiapane. Then I, that's when if Monahan and Mangiapane don't stop clicking, the change that I make is Mangiapane top line with Gaudreau. What do you think, Kevin? I don't mind it. I mean, they started the training camp. It was Lindholm, Gaudreau, and Coleman. So I do think that there's an interest in there. Um, I think Monahan, Kachuk, and Manjapani would be. I think would be a good line. I don't mind. I don't mind that. Uh, I guess. Do you? I was. I was thinking that you throw do switch Dubé and Coleman, but still, it's. I guess it still comes down to usage, though, because you're still. It seems like, like I'm, I mean, I'll have to just looking at the ice time here. They're still using. It's. It seems to me. It's. This is also an issue of deploy, where it's more five on five. Like special teams wise, I mean, you're not putting Manjapani more. I mean, there's maybe a legitimate argument. Maybe, maybe a switch is. Um, you switch Majapani and Kachuk and put Kachuk on PP2 and put Majapani on PP1. I mean, the argument, he has 10 goals. He's leading the team in goals. Yeah. How is he not I mean, on the Flyers' number one power play? Yeah. It's, 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 it's a very good argument. And I, I like, like you look, because Majapani and Kachuk play similar roles on the power play units. And that is something that I think does, to an extent, make quite a bit of sense. Um, it would be- I, I like your idea, Mike, of putting Kachuk, A, on his own line, and I think B, back on the left side. I think he's been more effective on the left side than the right, and I can see him driving that line uh, very easily on line two. Yeah, and there are changes that you can make after that. To start, I would go Kachuk, Monaghan, and Mangiapane. If it comes down to it, maybe we see Kachuk, Backlund, Mangiapane come back, and that's been a line that's been good in the past. Um, but I think... I think it is a good idea to have Kachuk driving his own line. And you can still have that line with Gaudreau and Lindholm and Kachuk go out in critical moments um, and try and wreak havoc and, and, and get all offense shooting. Yeah. But for regular, you know, second period action, I think that is what I would do. Um, I think that feels more balanced, too. And I look at the top six now. If we look at the third line as Dubé, Backlund, Lewis, it just feels like there's more balance if we move Kachuk to that second line. I take Lewis off the third line, too, and I put Lucic there instead. Who do you instead. put there? I put Lucic there instead. Uh, but that's just okay. the one change I make. Um, so then your fourth line's what? Lewis, Richardson, Pitlick? Fourth line stinks. I mean, it's just not good. <laughs> it's it, like the, Whoever else is healthy? That's the problem, right? Like, that fourth line... I mean, Lucic is the best player on that line, which is... Not what you want. I mean, I don't mind Milan Lucic, but he shouldn't be driving a line. Um, like that's that's where they're missing Derek Ryan. Um, you know, that's that's um, that's where that's where I look at the Stockton Heat and say Adam Rzichka with nine goals in eleven games. Mm-hmm. This is a guy who I want to see. See if he if Lucic can teach him how to hit, and see if uh, see if Lucic can give him passes that he can put into the net. Um, because that would be a big difference. And, uh, you know, because right now, at, at best, you are hoping that the fourth line treads water. Um, and there is, we have seen Flames teams in the past that have been really good where the fourth line has been a driver uh, when it had Ryan and Mangiapane and Garnet Hathaway. And I don't see any reason why if they bring up the right players, we might be able to see that with the fourth line this year. I would like. I agree, and I think Lucic has value there to help. You know, like you were saying, teach those young guys. Yeah. Sorry, Kevin. I want to see them give a little bit of a longer look to Walker Dewar. He did have a good enough training camp that they kept him here. He, I mean, I mean, I guess some have argued he's a project, but he's in. He's up here. Why not give him a look in the next couple of games? 
Like, yeah, what is the loss? There. What is the loss here? I mean, who are you taking out to put him in? Nobody of consequence. Uh, yeah, exactly. yeah, Trevor Lewis, Tyler Pitlick. I I haven't been enamored with Tyler Pitlick at all this year. Trevor oh, Lewis has been given, awful. Yeah, Trevor Lewis has been better than Pitlick, I would argue, but um, it's. I think Pitlick maybe looked better when he was on that uh, back and Coleman line. It was. I think it was a bit more of a sum of its parts, but I don't think he's looked great by himself. No. Yeah, I wouldn't mind seeing Walker Dewar. It's so funny with Walker Dewar. Entering this season, I had him as the Flames' second-worst prospect. Um, and it's just funny how things can immediately turn on their head. I, I, like, I, I, in my off-season rankings, I had, they had 40 guys who qualified under my rankings, and I had him 39th. And I, Because I, I watched him in his first five AHL games with the Heat, and he was lost. He just he wasn't there. And it was just Mike. Something. A lot of us thought the same when Luke yeah. Phillips signed out of uh, you know Canadian universities yeah. too. That he just was a project and a long term guy. Yeah. And I like Phil, I like Philp honestly probably a little bit more than Walker Dewar. Um, but Walker Dewar has uh, attributes that make him undeniably appealing at the NHL level. Um, you know, and honestly, but at the same time with Walker Dewar, um, he's here beyond this season. There are guys in the American League who are unlikely to be here or who could make their case to stay here beyond this yeah. year because they're pending UFAs, uh, guys who have been prospects in the past. Guys like Glenn Godden is going to be a UFA at the end of this season, a Group 6 UFA, because he just hasn't played enough NHL games at this point, and he's turning 25. And so he might be gone at the end of the season, and the Flames might be letting a guy you know, just walk out sight unseen if they don't give him a little bit more time. Now, I don't love Glenn Godden. Um, never really been that convinced in Glenn Godden's potential when I've been watching. But is Glenn Godden a serviceable enough number four? But he might be, and I'm not convinced that the Flames currently have one of those. Another guy is Luke Philp. Uh, Luke Philp is going to be a Group 6 UFA. And then another guy is Justin Kirkland, who I am even less enamored on than Godden, uh, but he's another guy who's going to be a Group 6 UFA, and he's a guy who they had up at the end of training camp. So they have options. I think you also have to figure out what you're going to do with Matthew Phillips before too long that here is true. as well. Yeah, Phillips is a little bit younger, so he has a little bit longer uh, pathway, I think. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, that's definitely something. Uh, I wouldn't, I wouldn't bring him up just yet. Um, but if no. uh, but it, I agree with I agree with you, Mike. I think you know Walker Dewar. We know he's here. We can always come back to him, but we got to figure out what we have in some of these guys, and if we keep him around or get rid of them. And I think you know those guys like. Godden, I mean, he's 24. We got to figure out: do we keep him? Do we get rid of him? Like you said, Kirkland's 25. Is he a keeper? Is he an AHL tweener? Well, that's, or is yeah. he someone we say goodbye to? That's the thing, right? Because Dewar and Phillips are guaranteed to be here. Like they're RFAs yeah. or they are under contract. They're gonna be here because they're gonna get qualified. Godden can leave if he doesn't want to come back. He's gone. If the Flames don't show interest enough because they haven't seen him enough, they don't have the power to just qualify him and keep him. He's gone. So I think it's time that they start looking at these guys if they're really interested in them yeah. or not. Well, here's the thing. And I and I think part of that, too, is I think as, as Flames fans, a lot of people expect these guys are going to come up and crack the top nine. Somebody's got to be a fourth-line guy, and there's a living to be made being a fourth-line center in the NHL, and I think that might be Godden's upside. Yeah. Yeah. Well, here's the other thing, too. With this, I'm just looking at the Flames' schedule. You've got Buffalo uh, tomorrow. you got Buffalo Thursday. Islander Saturday, Boston, Chicago, and then Pitt, Winnipeg and then Pittsburgh, and then you're off to California and Vegas. This would be the time that you're not, you've got points in your pocket. You're not intensely into the playoff race yet. This is the time that you can do a little bit of experimentation and it's not going to hurt you. And also coming the start of December, we happen to be in California, so it's nice and close if you want to bring a guy out to give him a shot. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I I think yeah. And I think we're seeing like with Walker Dewar, I think that we're seeing just because of COVID protocols, when they go on these long road trips, they're going to bring an extra body, like just just to have that body around because it's going to take some time to move guys back and forth, and there could be restrictions. So I think you might see that guy like Rujishka get the next road trip or something like that, just to have that body with them. Do you throw a Jacob Pelche out? Yeah, I wouldn't yet. That's the thing that's going to keep Phillips from getting recalled is that they have a guy who is of a similar profile who is of higher pedigree, uh, who will yeah. get the call first if that's the player that they are looking for. Um, and so that's that's going to be the tough thing. But with Pelche, um, yeah, that's 
he is a guy who I think we're going to see at this, this season. I think he's definitely a guy who is going to get a look very soon. Well, guys, and then that kind of wraps up the week that is for the Flames, unless there's anything that anyone else wants to talk about. Uh, uh, just a couple, maybe one thing I'm just going to put out there at a couple quick questions. That, well, maybe maybe for a future conversation. Um, Vladar at some point may also need to get paid. And I'm just going to throw another scenario out there. Is, I, I know that they were, I know the Flames were loath that Kevin Weeks put out Matthew Kachuk's name and trade rumors in the Eichel deal. Just thinking about where Manjapani is and what we got to do with Johnny Gaudreau, I wonder if there, if the right offer came, would they consider trading Matthew? I think absolutely they would. Um, just depends on what that offer is. Yeah. Well, this is what I say to Matt all the time. Matt says if the right offer comes, and I say to Matt, what is that right offer? I mean, any you know, the million dollar man in WWE is everybody's got a price, right? What is what is the price? to get Matthew and what would you have to get back right it just depends because like the suitors that I would think that make the most sense for Matthew are the teams that his dad played for and St. Louis is a team that I could definitely see having interest um, but the pieces that St. Louis has to offer I well, just, that's it I can't I can't think of a package I'd want to put together from St. Louis I mean well like because like, there's a the thing the guy that I want is Jordan Cairo and I don't think they'd move him at this point um, no. and Robert Thomas is not good enough, and Thomas is the guy who Chuck probably want to play with in St. Louis. So, um, and other than that, it's tough. Scott Perunovic, I like him, but like it's just it's tough. Arizona is the other team, and he doesn't fit their window at all. So I don't know, no. like it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So beyond that, I don't really know. Um, like, and I think the teams that he would fit their window aren't going to have the cap room to bring him in and aren't going to want to give up the big contract for him. I mean, I, you know, if you're looking for a move at the deadline, you're not trying to inherit $7 million. No. So it's it's a deal that, you know, it, it depends on what kind of assets you're looking to get back. That totally changes the game. If you're trying to, trying to still compete or if you're rebuilding, that's totally different. Uh, and if, that's the time I could see it maybe working. If this team doesn't make it this year and they're going for futures, then I could see there being a lot of deals. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, the number of teams that are on the upswing that are going to want to maybe give up futures for Matthew Kachuk, I think there are going to be teams like that. This year, not so much. Yeah. yeah. Kevin, you were mentioning Vladar. I think Vladar is interesting too because, I mean, we've got Wolf, and I think Wolf's the guy we want to take our sweet time with. You don't want to rush him up there. But I think, you know, you can't pay Vladar as long as Markstrom's here. So you've got to really figure out, is Vladar a good backup? Is Vladar a, a starter? Or does Vladar stay as backup and eventually Wolf becomes a starter? Like, I think it's a good problem to have. Well, it, and the other thing is, is Markstrom going to last that contract? That's the other thing as well. At $6 million at five years, I don't... Well, and I think eventually Markstrom becomes the, you know, the grizzled veteran backup to Vladar or Wolf or whoever's next. Yeah, I, I, I would take my time with Wolf. I, 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 I think Wolf is about as untouchable as a prospect of this organization as it should be. But um, Vladar is an interesting case because he's he was another. He's found money for the Flames. Um, I'm not saying that there's a goaltending controversy, but I think it's. But I think like Shillington, we're seeing him in a in a good season for the first time, and I don't want to say Vladar is the key until we get a little more look at him. Yeah, for sure. No. And goaltending is also far less projectable. That's the one yeah, thing. It is. We, we've seen yeah. David Riddick go on 940 months, and you know when he was first coming up with the Flames, and and it's it, it's tough. But I mean, you know, I, I'm not. I mean, we saw it. Henry Carlson look good for a month. Like you know, goalies come, goalies go. So, yeah, it's hard to yeah. say. Yeah. Uh, before we get to our predictions this week, and I'm going to let you guys uh, predict for Matt, and Matt never does well at this, so we'll give him two cracks to win next week from both of you. But before we get there, uh, I'd say probably the most memorable flame in the last little bit, our uh, fearless leader for a long time, Jerome McGinley, into the Hall of Fame this week. Anybody have any Jerome memories that they want to share and besides that song from 04, We're All in the Dome, Chilling with Jerome? Um. I think the one, you know, I know that nobody really likes Eric Francis, but I, I will give him credit for bringing up the fact that that fight with Brendan Shanahan that he had with the blood out of his eye. I forgot about that fight. Um, the fact that he he became 
a, like from a 63 goals and 63 games with the Camelot's Blazers to a guy that I remember Eric Duhatchik saying he needed to play meaner um, and did it and just changed his game to what he became. Just um, to a guy that you just didn't really want to fight. Um, yeah, that's I think the the big memory with Jerome. Just how. He made the Flames tough, and he, you know, it's and, he. He saved the franchise, and he do what he needed to do. Like you said, the fight. I mean, how many guys in that role go out there and drop the gloves as much as Jerome would? He knew what he needed to do to get this team going. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mike, what about you? Any Jerome memories? I have a vivid recollection of the day he was traded, um, and I was not. I was in. I was in a hotel room in Anaheim, and I woke up and I turned on ESPN. I mean, I'm probably the only guy in the world who learned about the Jerome McGinley trade through ESPN um, and who actually cared about it. Um, and it was, they didn't talk about it, but it was just on the ticker at the bottom of the screen and I had to reread it like three You know times. we have this thing called the internet now, right? Yeah, well, I was, I was like 13. Uh, and yeah, like it, it was, and I had just woken up. I just turned on the TV. And because I think it was a deal that sort of happened overnight. And, uh, you know, I, 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 I honestly didn't even know about the... Uh, the Aaron Ward thing with uh, him saying that he was going to go to Boston and then he ended up going to Pittsburgh and because uh, I was on vacation, uh, I was just I was I was I was at Disney, and uh, and I I had sort of checked out of that season, and so that was just the quintessential way to learn about the Flames losing a guy when I was in Anaheim because the Flames always lose in Anaheim. Yeah, it's uh, you know. You're you're right. I mean that that trade. I remember sitting there as well. I was waking up the next morning here in Calgary, and I saw on my phone Jerome McGinley trade, and I was expecting a big return. I just remember feeling like we got gut punched when I saw what the Flames got back. Yeah, like hadn't they already? I thought they were going to get like Oli Mata, and like like good prospects. Like who was a good prospect in Pittsburgh at the time? Was Bo Bennett there? I mean, I don't know, but like I like the guys that they got were sort of Z list prospects. Um, it was like I didn't know if they were even Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh's top ten at the time. You know, I'll say that I think the memories I have of Jerome aren't necessarily on the ice, but I've seen him at a lot of community events, and he was always first guy in, last guy out. He would be the guy that would make sure everyone got an autograph, everyone got a picture, everyone got to say hi, even if he had a plane to catch or a bus to catch. Like Jerome was that consummate captain, and I think that's something that Calgary hasn't had a lot of. And he respected the game, like he respected. You know, when Trevor Linden retired, he made sure the Flames were on the ice to shake his hand. Um, he, you know, I just, I know, I think the other memory that just popped into my head is the night he returned when he played for Boston. There were more fans cheering for Boston and Aginla than the Flames that night. And it, it's just, they wanted to see Aginla score a goal so bad on that, that night. I just, he, it's, I don't, yeah, there's not been a franchise impact. Like, with all due respect to Mika, I mean, who's probably second, again, was the franchise of this team. You know what was really cool was this preseason, this past preseason. I was at uh, the Flames' first home game of that preseason against the Seattle Kraken. Um, and that was the game where, you know, Oliver Shillington first took his step. Um, but also at that game, uh, Mark Giordano scored. And the eruption that came from the crowd when I heard that. That reminded me of that game that you just mm -hmm. talked about, that Boston game. And it was, yeah, it's just Calgary loves the, Calgary loves its captains. And uh, I can see why they're, they're maybe waiting a little bit long longer to get this next one right because it's sort of hard to follow on the footsteps of those two. Well, and I think the guy who a lot of people think is heir apparent to the C is a pending UFA. So I think if you lock him up, and I think a lot of people think that uh, Matthew Kachuk's the heir apparent, you want to lock him up before you put a C on him. Yeah. yeah, I mean, definitely. I would honestly, you know, what I would do is if if Johnny extends, I would put an A on him. Yeah. So, guys, December nineteenth, nineteen ninety five, Calgary Flames trade Joe Newendike to the Dallas Stars for Jerome McGinley and Corey Millen. Now that everyone's retired, who wins that trade? Oh, hard to argue with the team that won the cup, but I mean, at the same time, you know, you can't. I think if we look at those guys, Jerome did more for the Flames than I think Newendike oh, did for the Stars. It's not even a question. I mean, yeah, like it's you got a guy who comes to a team and is the best player in franchise history, 
I mean, you can't. That that that's. Just... And I would say not just in franchise history. I would say for a few years when he played, the best player of his of in the league. Probably, yeah. There were probably a couple of years there. Yeah, definitely. I would say not a top one hundred player of all time, though. So it's. Uh, yeah. What do you that. think, Kev? Uh, yeah, I think I think it's hard not to say that Calgary did not win the trade. I mean, you and I left shortly Dallas shortly after they won that cup, and Corey Millen while not a legend of Flames lore, was actually a pretty good player that year for the Flames, even though they were a terrible team at the time. Corey Millen was not a terrible player. So I would say that the Flames did win that trade. Corey Millen never really played pro after that. He went, uh, played, got traded in 96, and then he went on to play for the Cologne Sharks of the the, uh, Dell League after that. So, yeah, kind of uh, the end of his NHL career. Yeah, yeah. Well, guys, we'll do a fireside chat tradition, and Mike's done this a few times. Um, I think, Kevin, we've had you do it, but we usually do the predictions for the next week. Uh, historically, Matt loses this game because he's either over-optimistic or under-optimistic. So I told Matt we're going to give him two chances to win this week. We'll let you guys both pick, and if it's good with you, if either of you win, we'll give that point to Matt next week. Sounds good. Fine. Uh, that or I will mail you some sort of inflatable Stanley Cup that you can put in your room. <laughs> All right. Um, so we've got we got four games in the docket for the Flames this week. If we take a look at the week coming up, they're finishing their Eastern uh, road swing. I guess we could say their sort of New York area road swing. Tomorrow they play Buffalo, 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Saturday night it, uh, is the New York Islanders at 5 p.m. Mountain Time. Then they've got the Boston Bruins Sunday, and they're home to Chicago Blackhawks on Tuesday. So, Kevin, why don't we start with you? What are you thinking for this one? I think they go two and two. I think they win in Buffalo. I think they lose on the island, and I think they lose in Boston, and they win in Chicago. What do you think, Mike? All right, I think they lose 4-2 in Buffalo. I think it's going to be a trap game for them, but I think they're going to rebound in a big way on the island. Uh, I believe that's the first game in the Islanders' new arena. Yeah, that's uh, that's and, uh, that's why I think the Islanders win that one. But no, I think they're going to spoil it. I think it's going to be a five-one win for the Flames in that one. Wow. Um, and then uh, in Boston, that's a that's an interesting one to me because the Flames have actually been, I think, pretty good against Boston recently. Um, and not bad back to back this year. So I'm, what I'm going to say is, I think they're going to uh, get their get only their second overtime one of the season. I think they're going to win that one four to three. And then I think they're going to shut out the Blackhawks one nothing. So you think they're going to win New York, Boston, and Chicago? Yeah. So that'd be a much better week for them this week. Yeah. I think that they're going to lose to Buffalo. I think we've seen, if we look at the games against Montreal, where they underestimated them, I would even see that first period of Chicago of the. Uh, Sorry, the Ottawa game, I think that they might come out a little bit slow and uh, Buffalo might be able to... Buffalo's also been looking good lately and I think the Buffalo could could do something there. I think they're also going to lose the Boston game. I think Boston might overpower them. But I'm going to say, like Mike, I think they'll spoil the uh, New York Islanders game and I think that Chicago's turning into a dumpster fire so I think that they can win there. So I'll say uh, lose... Buffalo, Boston, win New York, Chicago. It would suck if they lost to Chicago. No, <laughs> just totally. Yes, yeah. you cannot yeah. lose to Chicago. Yeah. So that's nope. yeah. I think that I think that's what everybody's saying this year. Yeah, I think they're going to get goalied a little bit in that game. That's why I think it's going to be one nothing. But I don't think Chicago is going to score. I just hope it's a, no, a land of boos. I hope every time someone touches a puck on Chicago, it's a boo. I'm going to be and at that game. Yeah. Okay. Make yeah. sure that's when, not uh, boo earns. It's boo. Yeah. When when nineteen and eighty eight touch the puck, it's going to be boos, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Well, Kevin, Mike, thanks for joining us this week. Thanks for filling in for Matt. We appreciate you guys stepping in last minute and helping out. And I thought this was a lot of fun. It was a lot of, of fun. Always a pleasure. And I'm going to do Matt's usual sign off since he's not here. As always, go Flames, go. This episode was hosted by Dan Stevenson and co-hosted by Mike Gold and Kevin Olenek. The episode was produced by Peter Marino. Fireside Chat episodes are licensed under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Share-Alike License. The full license terms are available at firesidechat.ca.